Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see all of you here. Welcome to a very special presentation. 19 Miles to Music Row presents it's the Soldier's Song, a great musical, new musical work by Daniel Johnson and Wood Newton. It was on this day in 1865 that the 13th Amendment was ratified and slavery was abolished in the United States of America. How about that? Amen. So tonight we're gathered to kind of reflect on that unsettling dark time in the history of the United States in a very unique way through music and spoken words of that time. We want to encourage you to lean into the emotions that you'll feel. Feel free to clap and sing along with the songs that you know. Laugh when you hear something funny. Applaud in appreciation for the performances. Shed tears in remembrance of those who gave their lives. The music tells the story of that time, a very conflicted time, as you know. Let the music move you and give you a new understanding of our American history. Welcome to the night of the soldier song. It began with a volley of cannon fire from the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina on April the 12th, 1861. Four years later, its ending was negotiated without pomp or celebration at the quiet home of Wilmer McLean in the village of Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. But it wasn't its beginning or its ending that distinguished it from any other armed conflict throughout history. Its distinguishing mark was the rivers of red blood that were shed on American soil as brothers fought against brothers, kinsmen against kinsmen, countrymen against countrymen. Today, this four year period of bloody fighting lives by a variety of names. Some call it the American Civil War. Some call it the war between the states. You can still find some who call it the war of northern aggression. No matter what name it is called by, it was war. Union General William T. Sherman accurately labeled what it is for any age and time. He said, it is only those who have neither fired a shot nor heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded who cry aloud for blood, more vengeance, more desolation. War is hell. These four years of hell on American soil came about in spite of warnings of imminent destruction by leaders from both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. On March 4th, 1861, 
just two weeks after Jefferson Davis had been inaugurated as the first and only president of the Confederacy, U.S. President Abraham Lincoln stated in the last two paragraphs of his first inaugural address. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You have no conflict without yourselves being the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passions have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this land will yet swell the course of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. President Lincoln offered Robert E. Lee an opportunity to leave the Union Army. But because of his allegiance to his home state, Virginia, Lee declined and resigned his commission in the U.S. Army to become a general in the Confederate Army. Later, he would become his much respected leader. Prior to Lincoln's offer, these were the words of Lee. They do not know what they say. If it came to a conflict of arms, the war will last at least four years. Northern politicians will not appreciate the determination and pluck of the South. And Southern politicians do not appreciate the numbers, resources, and patient perseverance of the North. Both sides forget that we are all Americans. I foresee that our country will pass through a terrible ordeal a necessary expiation, perhaps, for our national sins. Legendary Texas Governor Sam Houston warned his fellow Texans. Let me tell you what is coming. After the sacrifice of countless millions of treasure and hundreds of thousands of lives, you may win Southern independence, but I doubt it. The North is determined to preserve this union they're not a fiery, impulsive people as you are, for they live in colder climates. But when they begin to move in a given direction, they move with the steady momentum and perseverance of a mighty avalanche. In spite of these and other prophetic utterances, hell came. Yet, in the midst of the fever and fury of the hell of war, life prevailed. And where you find life, you find music. Music to uplift the weary soul. Music to inspire the hearts. Music to commemorate the brave. Music to save the soul. Music to encourage those who are fighting to keep fighting the fight. The music of life and war. Look away, 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 look away,
Her smile disappears as the boy he found her. Look away, look away, look away, look away, look away, Dixie Land. And I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray, hooray. In Dixie Land, I'll take my stand. To live and die in Dixie. Away, away, away down south in Dixie. Away, away, away down south in Dixie. Butcher's cleaver, but that did not seem to grieve her. Look away, 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 look away. Oh, Mrs. Jack did the foolish part, died for a man that broke her heart. Look away, 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 It was Daniel Decatur Emmett, a self-taught fiddler from Mount Vernon, Ohio, who wrote Dixie's Land in 1859 on the brink of the War of Hell. The original version of the song was written as a comic melody, and its tune was said to be, have been taken from a tune from an old plantation melody. When the Civil War began, Confederate General Albert Pike wrote new words using the song to call the South to bear arms and defend the newly formed nation. When Jefferson Davis had the song played at his inauguration as president of the Confederacy, Dixieland was one of the first prizes of the war. <clears throat> Needless to say, Emmett, a staunch unionist, was not pleased. <laughs> However, on May the 5th, 1861, Henry Hotze of the Mobile Cadets pondered the effect of the lively tune upon the newly declared nation, which was his homeland. It is marvelous with what wildfire repatriated this tune of Dixie has spread over the whole South. Considered as an intolerable nuisance when first the streets re-echoed it from the repertoire of wandering minstrels, it now bids fair to become the musical symbol of a new nationality. And we shall be fortunate if it does not impose its very name on our country. The music of brass bands played a very important role for both armies during the Civil War. Both armies used music to encourage young men to enlist at recruitment rallies. In the summer of 1862, after the Union Army had suffered a series of military setbacks, President Abraham Lincoln put out a call for 300,000 volunteers to serve for three years and to fill the depleted ranks of the Union Army. Upon hearing Lincoln's request, James Sloan Gibbons, a Quaker abolitionist, wrote a poem that was published in the New York Post. The poem was set to music by Stephen Foster, as well as L.O. Emerson and the Hutchison Family Singers. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. From Mississippi's winding stream and from New England shore We leave our plows and workshops, our wives and children here With hearts too full for utterance, with but a silent tear We dare not look behind us, but steadfastly before We are coming, Father Abraham, three hundred thousand more We are coming, 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 coming our union, union to restore, restore. Come in, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. If you look a 
across the hilltops that meet the northern sky. Long moving lines of rising dust your vision may descry. And now the wind an instant tears the cloudy veil aside and floats aloft our spangled flag in glory and in pride. And bayonets in sunlight gleam and bands break music for. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. We are coming, 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 our union to restore. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. We are coming, 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 our union to restore. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. We are coming, 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 our union to restore. We are coming, Father Abraham, 300,000 more. Both armies used regimental bands, although the Confederate armies had fewer bands than the Union armies because there were fewer musicians in the South. Also, instruments were very hard to obtain. In a July 7, 1862 letter to the Secretary of State of the Union, the Honorable William H. Seward, the Adjutant General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, William Schooler, expressed the importance of music and musicians to the Union Army. Since we were honored with a visit from yourself and General Buckingham, I have given a good deal of consideration to the matter of recruiting, and in this, I propose to state some of the points which I regard as important. First, we should be allowed a band of 10 musicians for each camp to enliven the men and give attraction to the camp. This proposition I made when you were here, and I understand you and General Buckingham to accede to it, but I wish to have the authority in writing so it may go on file. The cost to each camp will be about $400 a month. With great respect, dear Governor, I am your obedient servant, W.M. Schowler, Adjutant General. It was in July 1862 that Union General Daniel Butterfield of the 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Army Corps, Army of the Potomac, adapted the infantry call for extinguished lights and created the haunting melody of taps, a song that has been used at military funerals and ceremonies since the 1880s. In both armies, a drummer usually accompanied each regiment. The drummers played a variety of drum beats, each that had significance for the soldiers. Drummers could signal for soldiers to get into formation, roll call, wake up calls in the morning, and lights out at night. Perhaps the most important role that music played during the Civil War was in telling the stories of the soldiers who fought during the bloody four years of hell on American soil. Soldiers on both sides really liked to make music and sing to pass the time when they weren't fighting. Musical instruments such as flutes, harmonicas, guitars, banjos, fiddles, and homemade instruments were commonplace in both armies. One of the favorite tunes of the Confederate Army paid tribute to one of the South's leading crops, the lowly, humble peanut. Sitting by the roadside on a summer's day, chatting with my messmates, passing time away, lying in the shadow. Goodness, how delicious eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious eating goober peas. 
general hears a row. He says, the Yanks are coming. I hear their rifles now. He turns around and wonders, what do you think he sees? Georgia militia eating Uber peas. Peas, 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 peas eating Uber peas. Goodness, how delicious eating Uber peas. Almost long enough. The subject is interesting, but the rhymes are mighty rough. I wish this war was over when free from rags and fleas. We'll kiss our wives and sweethearts and gobble goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious eating Uber peas. During my days of service to the cause of the South, that song, Goober Peas, was always one of my favorites. My buddies in Company H used to tease me because I liked to sing at the top of my lungs. They'd say to me, Sam Watkins, if you sing any louder, them Yankees are going to think we got a bunch of new cannons thundering off. <laughs> anyway, we like to sing almost as much we, as we like to eat them little goobers. We'd eat them boiled, parched, or any way we could get them. It didn't matter. Sometimes that's about all we could find to eat. There were only about four things that gave us some measure of pleasure while we were in camp waiting for a fight. We always appreciated getting to eat whatever food we could get to eat. We liked attending our church services, and we loved gathering around the campfire, drinking, singing until the, they played extinguished lights. One of the boys in my company was born out in Texas, and he loved it when we'd sing the Yellow Rose of Texas. <laughs> There's a yellow rose in Texas I am gone to see No other soldier knows her No soldier, only me She cried so when I left her It like to broke my heart and If I ever find her We never more shall part She's the sweetest rose of color This soldier ever knew Her eyes are bright as diamonds they sparkle like they do You may talk about your dearest way And sing a rose and leaf But the yellow rose of Texas Beats the bells of Tennessee Where the Rio Grande is flowing And the starry skies are bright She walks along the river In quiet summer nights she thinks it fire when we parted long ago. I promise to come back again and never leave her so. She's the sweetest rose of color, this soldier ever knew. Her eyes are bright as diamond, they sparkle like the do. You can talk about your dearest thing, sing a rose and leave. But the yellow rose of Texas beats the bells of Probably the thing we loved to do the most was writing and reading letters to and from our loved ones back home. Men pined away from the women that they loved. A lot of times when they were thinking about their women back home, they had asked the musicians in the camp to play one of their favorite love songs of the day, Ora Lee. <laughs> Spring on the willow tree 
sat and rocked, I heard him sing, singing orally. Orally, orally, made of golden hair. Sunshine came along with thee and swallows in. The rose was born, music when you spake. Through thine azure eyes, the morn sparkling seemed to break. Orally, orally, bird of crimson wing. Never I saw many of a burly soldier crying like a baby, holding a letter in his hands. Some of the letters that my fellow soldiers wrote were so eloquent and touching they should have been published in books. Once a Yankee officer wrote, My very dear Sarah, Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistible on all these chains to the battlefield. The memories of the blissful moments I have spent with you come creeping over me. And I feel most grateful to God and to you that I have enjoyed them for so long. How hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years when, God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and seen our sons grow up to honorable manhood around us. I have, I know, but few and small claims upon divine providence. But something whispers to me. Perhaps it's the wafted prayer of my little Edgar that I shall return to my loved ones unharmed. If I do not, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I love you and that when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and my many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless and foolish I have oftentimes been. How gladly would I wash out with my tears every spot on your happiness. But, oh Sarah, if the dead could come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they loved, I shall always be near you in the gladdest days and in the darkest nights. Always. Always. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be my breath. And as the cool air fans your throbbing temple, it shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. I think I am gone, and wait for me, for we shall meet again. The soldier that wrote that beautiful letter, Sullivan Ballou, was killed at the Battle of Bull Run two weeks after he wrote it.
sweet Early in the war, the Southern Army won several key battles, including the Battle of Bull Run, in which a daring young Confederate general, Stonewall Jackson, inspired the imaginations of many journalists and writers. After years of service as a soldier and an educator, Jackson rode off to war in April 1861. And following the first battle of Manassas, which was also known as Bull Run, Jackson became widely known by the nickname Stonewall. He earned lasting fame as a hero for his leadership of Confederate forces, especially during the Valley Campaign of 1862. Stonewall Jackson, a deeply religious man, died on May the 10th, 1863 as a result of complications from wounds received by friendly fire at Chancellorsville, along with pneumonia. General Robert E. Lee was grieved upon hearing of the death of his friend and comrade. Lee said of Jackson, Any victory would be dear at such a price. With his wife by his side as he died, Jackson's last words were said to have been, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. <laughs> My sweet and loving wife, you promised till death do us part. Now you're standing by my side. My fleeting days on earth are through, and death is drawn.
I'm at peace. I'll fight no more. My sword is in its sheath. So dry the tears from your eyes and let the willow weep. The angels will be coming soon to set my spirit free. And in the twinkling of an eye, you will be with me. I know. In the Civil War, music publishing companies began to flourish as songwriters such as George Frederick Root, who began to write patriotic songs for the Union War effort. Root was born in Sheffield, Massachusetts in 1820. A gifted musician, he had mastered no fewer than 13 different instruments by the age of 12. He became a private music teacher and eventually began composing, writing in the classical genre. He also became a partner in a business called Root and Caddy, a Chicago-based music publishing firm that sold songbooks and instruments and published a music-oriented periodical called The Song Messenger of the Northwest. After the Civil War started, he put aside his pursuit as a serious composer to write Union Army classics such as Tramp, 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 The Battle Cry of Freedom, and Chess Before the Battle Mother. These songs helped to establish Root as perhaps the most popular and certainly the most prolific of Civil War period composers, songwriters. of the same song were sung across the Mason-Dixon line. They used the same melody, but the soldiers would often rewrite the words to promote their own cause. Our flag is proudly floating on the land and on the main. Shout, shout, the battle cry of freedom. We'll keep it up, we'll conquer it, and we'll conquer up again. Shout, shout, the battle cry of freedom. Our Dixie forever, never at a loss. Down with the eagle and up with the cross. We'll rally around the bonnie flag, we'll rally once again. Shout, shout, the battle cry of freedom. Our the Dixie forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah. Down with the traitors and up with the stars. While we rally around the flag, boys, we'll rally once again. Shout.
Just before the battle, mother, I am thinking most of you. While upon the field we're watching, with the enemy in view, comrades brave are round me lying, filled with thoughts of home and God, for well they know that on the morrow, some will sleep beneath the sun, farewell mother you may never, press me to your heart again, but oh you'll not forgive me mother, if I'm numbered with the slain. Hark, I hear the bugle sounding, tis the signal for the fight. Now may God protect us, Mother, as he ever does the right. Hear the battle cry of freedom, how it swells upon the air. Oh, yes, we'll rally round the standard, or we'll nobly perish there. Farewell, mother, you may never press me to your breast again. But, oh, not forgive me, mother, if I'm numbered with the slain. Although the battle cry of freedom had different meanings for the Union and the Confederacy. There was a cry for freedom that had basically been ignored since the foundation of the United States. That cry came from those who were bought and sold into slavery, particularly in the southern and border states. Although in his first inaugural address, President Lincoln had denied that his presidency would result in the abolition of the institution of slavery in the United States. By 1863, his convictions had bore upon his conscience the idea that freedom was meant for all people. On January the 1st, 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. Although the proclamation did not end slavery in this nation, it did capture the hearts of those who viewed the institution as immoral, and it helped to transform the character of the war. From the day that it was issued, every victory and advancement of federal troops expanded the domain of freedom. The proclamation also allowed the acceptance of black men into the Union Army and Navy, giving the Union much needed manpower in its cause. By the end of the Civil War, almost 200,000 black soldiers and sailors had been enlisted to fight in support of the Union cause. They was talking in the cabin They was talking in the hall But I listened kind of curious Not a thinking about it all And on Sunday 
to I noticed they were whispering mighty much standing all around the roadside when they let us out of church well I didn't think about it twelve the middle of the week and my liars come to see me and somehow he couldn't speak then I see it all in a minute what he come to see me for they had listed colored soldiers and my liars gone to war then I told of all the weary miles that he would have to travel and I couldn't be contented when they took him to the camp. Why my heart now broke with grieving, who oh, twill I seed him on the street. Then I felt like I could go and throw my body at his feet. He kissed me when he left me, and I promised to be true. And they put a knapsack on him and a coat all colored blue. And I gave him paths of Bible from the bottom of the drawer. When they listed colored soldiers and my liars going to war. Both my masters went in gray suits. And I love that Yankee blue. But I told that I could sorrow for the losing of him too. But I couldn't, for I didn't know the half of what I saw. Twelve they listed color soldiers, and my liars went to Master Jack come home all sickly. He was broke for life, they said. And they laid his poor young son somewhere else on the roadside day. When the women cried and moaned him, I could feel it two and two. For I had a love and fighting in the way of danger too. Then they told me they had laid him somewhere else way down south to rest with the flag that he had fit for shining hell across his breast. Well, I cried but then I reckon that's what God had called him for. When they listed colored soldiers and my liar went to war. When they listed colored soldiers and my liars went For many people on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line, they believe their soldiers were fighting a holy war for a holy cause. 
And they were not ashamed to call upon the same God in which they both believed to beseech him for victory in the results in war for which they desired. Their firm belief in the Almighty is reflected in the music. One of the roused and inspirational anthems performed in the North during the Civil War was Julia Ward's Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built at him an altar in the east. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching. It is believed that the first song that was published in the Confederacy was the hymn-like song, God Save the South, which was written early in the war by a Marylander, George H. Miles. Miles wrote the song under the pseudonym Ernest Halpin. The lyrics were set to music by Charles Wolfgang Amadeus Hellerbrock. God save the South, God save the South, her altars and firesides, God save the South. Now that the war is nigh, now that we arm to die, chanting our battle cry, freedom or death. Chanting our battle cry, freedom or death. God made the right stronger than might. Millions would trample us down in their pride. Lay thou their legions low, roll back the ruthless foe. Let the proud spoiler know God's on our side. Let the proud spoiler know God's on our side. As a soldier of the Army of the Confederate States of America, I can tell you that a lot of the boys in Company H believed that Al Almighty God was on the side of the South. But the things that I saw during the battles I fought in made me wonder where God was. I was at the Battle of Shiloh. It was one awful battle, a battle that lives on in song. Valiant soldiers, a story I will tell. A 
About the bloody battle that was fought on Shiloh Hill It was an awful struggle, it'll cause your blood to chill It was the famous battle that was fought on Shiloh Hill About an hour of sunrise, the battle it began. Before the day was ended, we fought them hand to hand. The horrors of the field did my heart with anguish fill. For the wounded and the dying that lay on shallow hill. The wounded men were crying for help from everywhere. While others who were dying were offering God their prayer. Protect my wife and children, if it is thy holy will. Such were the prayers I heard that night on Shallow Hill. Early the next morning, we were called to arms again. Unmindful of the wounded, unuseful to the slain. The struggle was renewed again, 10,000 men were killed. This was the second conflict of the famous Shallow Hill. The battle it raged on, though dead and dying men. They thick all over the ground, on the hill and on the glen. And from their deadly wounds, the blood ran like a reel. Such were the mournful sights I saw on shallow hills. Now my song is ended about those bloody plains. I hope the sight by mortal man may ne'er be seen again. But I pray to God the Savior, it consistent with thy will. Save the souls of all who fell on bloody shallow hill. God save the souls of all who fell on bloody shallow On December the 30th, 1862, the armies of the Union and Confederate States of America faced each other in the forest and fields south and west of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That night, as General Braxton Bragg of the Army of Tennessee and General William S. Rosecrans of the Union Army of Cumberland planned their attacks, the soldiers of both armies laid in the rocks and mud trying to sleep. In an attempt to raise the spirits of their soldiers, the bands of both armies played their favorite tunes. It was during this night, on the eve of the Battle of Stones River, that one of the most poignant moments of the Civil War occurred. The scene was recounted by Sam C., of the 1st Tennessee Infantry. The military bands on each side began their evening music. The still winter night carried their strains to great distance. At every pause on our side, far away, could be heard the military bands of the other. Finally, one of them struck up, Home Sweet Home. As if by common consent, all other airs ceased, and the bands of both armies, as far as the ear could reach, joined in the refrain. Who knows how many hearts were bold next day by reason of that air. and palaces though I may roam 
be it ever so humble there's no place like home a charm from the sky seems to hallow us there which seek through the world is there met with elsewhere home home sweet sweet home there's no place like home there's no place like home to thee i'll return or The heart's dearest solace will smile on me there. No more from that cottage again will I roam. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. When I was wounded at the Battle of Murfreesboro, the shell and shot that struck me knocked me winding. I said, oh, I'm wounded. And at the same time, I grabbed my arm. I thought it had been torn from my shoulder. As I went back to the field hospital, I overtook another man walking along. I do not know in what regiment he belonged, but I remember at first noticing that his left arm was entirely gone. His face was as white as a sheet. The breast and sleeve of his coat had been torn away, and I could see the frazzled end of his shirt sleeve, which appeared to be sucked into the wound. I looked at it pretty close, and I said, Great God, for I could see his heart throb and the respirations of his lungs. I was filled with wonder and horror at the sight. He was walking along when all at once he dropped down and died without a struggle or groan. I could tell hundreds of such incidents of battlefields, but I tell only this one because I remember it so distinctly. Concerning that song, Home Sweet Home, I guess every soldier, both blue and gray, dreamed of going home every second, every minute of every hour of every day. We dreamed about it and we sang about it. Marching home again, hoorah, hoorah. We'll give him a hearty welcome then, hoorah, hoorah. The men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all come out. We'll all feel gay when Johnny could marching Church bells will peal with joy, hoorah, hoorah, to welcome home our darling boy, hoorah, hoorah, the village lads and lads to say with roses, they will turn the way and we'll all feel gay when Johnny come marching home, we'll all feel gay when Johnny come marching I am Sergeant James Landon of the 5th Iowa Cavalry of the Union Army. The Johnny Rebs are not the only ones who dreamed about going back home. I spent six weeks at the Confederate prison camp, Camp Sumter, in the summer of 1864. And while I was there, I spent a lot of time dreaming and praying about going back home. 
I saw a lot of my brave friends who never made it back home. We had to bury them there in that Georgia clay. I know for a fact that what General Sherman said about war is the gospel truth. War is hell. I know because I lived through it in that damned old prison camp down in Andersonville. I was a sergeant in the 5th Cavalry. I wore the blue and fought for truth in Lincoln's army. To this day, I can't say the hatred that I feel for that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. I served with Sherman down in Georgia, busting up the rails. One day some damned old rebel soldiers snuck up on our tail. We lit out running, but they kept coming, caught us near a field. Took me to that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. When I walked through Sumter's gates the first day I arrived, I saw desperate starving men as thin as sheets of ice. I heard their moans and bitter wells, it all seemed unreal in that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. Our only source of water was the dirty stockade branch. It ran right through the middle of that damned old prison camp. Sometimes rats and soda crackers were our only meal. Down in that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. I cried out to Jesus, but I guess he couldn't hear. Cause those damned old Johnny Rebs were singing loud and drinking beer. Well, I looked the devil in the eye, he gave me quite a chill in that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. I'll go to heaven when I die, in spite of all my sin. St. Pete will meet me at the gate and welcome me within. Cause he'll know I paid my pittance down in a living hell. Down in that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. Yes, I paid my pittance and I live to tell. By that damned old prison camp at Andersonville. That damned old prison camp at Andersonville. Thankfully, the song of discord between the North and the South came to an end shortly after the tragedy of Andersonville. The end came almost as suddenly as the beginning. On April 9th, 1865, a tired and numerically inferior army of Northern Virginia under the leadership of General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain recalled the historic event. On they came with the old swinging route step and swaying battle flags. In the van, the proud Confederate ensign. 
Before us in proud humiliation stood the embodiment of manhood. Men whom neither toils and suffering nor the fact of death could bend from their resolve. Standing before us now, thin, worn, and famished, but erect, with eyes looking level into ours, waking memories that bound us together as no other bond. Was not such manhood to be welcomed back into a union so tested and assured? On our part, not a sound of trumpet, nor roll of drum, not a cheer, nor word, nor whisper, or vain glorying, nor motion of man, but an awed stillness rather, and breath holding, as if it were the passing of the dead. Six days later, the song of President Abraham Lincoln ended on a tragic note. Assassinated by the hand of one of America's leading actors, John Wilkes Booth, the tenuously reunited country faced yet another time of uncertainty. Gideon Wells described the grief of those who most loved the great leader who had endured and prevailed the most tragic hour of the young nation. On the avenue in front of the White House were several hundred colored people, mostly women and children, weeping and wailing their loss. This crowd did not diminish through the whole of that cold, wet day. They seemed to not know what was to be their fate since their great benefactor was dead. And those strong and brave men wept when I met them. The hopeless grief of those poor colored people affected me more than almost anything else. Yeah. 
I saw a lot of horrible things when I fought in that great war from hell. We learned a lesson in that war. It was a lesson learned at an incredible price. I hope it will be a lesson that America will never forget. America has no north, no south, no east, no west. The sun rises over the hills and sets over the mountains. The compass just points up and down. And we can laugh now at this absurd notion of there being a north and a south. We are one and undivided. One, two, three. <laughs> I'm Sam Mar Watkins of the First Tennessee. Went off to fight in the rebel army four long years in that bloody war. Were nothing civil about it, that's for sure. Chattanooga, Chickamauga, Kennesaw. I was there and part of it all. I wrote it down plain and a book to read. Company H of the First Tennessee. When it was all over, these words said best. There is no north, south, east, or west. Generation pass away, history will write it. We're one and undivided. At Shallow and Jones River, we fought the Yankee flu. Shies Hill, Nashville, Franklin, too. Brothers, father, mother, son, tried and true America. When it was all over, these words said best. There is no north, south, east, or west. Generation passed away. History will write it. One and nine divided. When it was all over, these words said best. There is no north, south, east, or west. Generation passed away. History will write it. We're one and nine. I'm Sam R. Watkins of the First Tennessee. I went off to fight for this country. Have you been blessed tonight? Yes. Yes. Woo. It is my honor to be able to introduce the, those that participated in tonight's uh, presentation. And uh, I am really grateful to have this opportunity. And first, I want to say thank you for being here tonight and to experience this presentation. And the reason is I think it's very, very important in this day and age, this time that we're living in, to have a message that 
has been presented tonight to be buried into our hearts and minds and souls. And to the, the primary message of the soldier song is this. Let love prevail. Let love prevail. In everything that we do, we need to let love prevail. In our po politics, we need to let love prevail. In the way that we react to our families, we need to let love prevail. In every circumstance of our life, we need to let love prevail. Amen? Amen. All right. So it's my honor to be able to introduce this fine cast that was here tonight. First of all, let's give a hand to the people that made this happen. Bill De Deaton and his uh, wonderful uh, staff of people that put everything together, the, all the setting up of the microphones and all the sound equipment. Give them a big hand for their work. For the 19 Miles Committee, 19 Miles to Music Row Committee, give them a great hand for their It's my understanding that this is a little bit, this kind of program was a little bit out of their realm, and they took a chance on it, and I believe everyone that's here has reaped the benefits from it. I know that my cast has. So let me introduce, first of all, let me say that Franklin was very, uh, the Franklin First United Methodist Church was a very instrumental part of the Civil War in the Battle of Franklin. And it's my understanding that during the Battle of Franklin, it was used as a military hospital, uh, the one that's downtown. And so anyone, anyway, they used it, and, uh, you know, uh, the pastor there, his name was E.M. Bounds. He was a Confederate, uh, Confederate uh, chaplain. And he was at the Battle of Franklin. And tonight, he was portrayed by Alan Corey. Give Alan Corey a hand. There he is. There he is. Where is he? Come on out here. Thank you, brother. And also, uh, portraying what has happened within the past two years uh, here in Franklin, a sense of healing is beginning to take place, and some things are being happening among the community leaders. And so anyway, realizing that they have, and part of the economy is based, uh, Franklin is based upon Civil War and the Battle of Franklin. They understood what they needed to do. And so they went together and they put up a statue of a black soldier down in the middle of town. And it was a healing process. And uh, Michael uh, Ricks took place in that ceremony. He was there, and he sang that song there that day when they unveiled that statue. So give Michael a hand. <laughs> Since 2011, when we first presented this show, on the stage of the Cherry Theater stage in uh, Columbia State Community College, where I was a professor at the time. Uh, we have done this show throughout the South, and we've done it over in uh, the old State Capitol Building Museum over in Little Rock, Arkansas, and had a wonderful, awesome night there. But by far, this has been the greatest night of presentation that we've ever had of the Soldier Song, and we thank you for that. <laughs> Most of these people have been with me from the very beginning. And over here to my left, the first man here, he is a Grammy Award-winning instrumentalist, banjoist, and he started the Nashville Bluegrass Band, and they won several Grammy Awards. And this is the man that is the instigator of it all, and he is a great mandolin player and banjo player, and we want you to make him welcome here tonight, Mr. Alan O'Brien. <laughs> 
sitting beside Alan, we have another fine instrumentalist and a guy who's been around Nashville for a long time, and he's played with uh, such names as Vern Gosden. He was the band leader for Vern Gosden, and he's a great songwriter and a great producer. And he wrote a song that maybe you heard uh, that uh, was it was a parody song. It, it was you know the song "She Thinks I Still Care." Well, he wrote he wrote the song, the parody song. She thinks I still cars. <laughs> and I want you to give my friend Jim Sales a hand. Next to him, we have a wonderful instrumentalist, and she's a world-class violinist and fiddle player. And she, for a number of years, was my fiddle teacher, and uh, I taught her everything she knows. So... <laughs> Anyway, she is the founder of the Fiddle and Pick uh, Music School out in uh, Pigram. And I want you to make her welcome, Gretchen Priest May. Give her a hand. <laughs> Next to Gretchen, we have a wonderful actress and singer and a longtime music resident of the music community in Nashville. And her dad was one of the original Fairfield Four quartet singers. And if you know anything about music history, that is a legendary group. And she has her own uh, group called the Settles Connection. And I want you to make her welcome, Miss Odessa Settles. Give her a hand. Sitting next to Odessa, we have a man who has won, also won a Grammy Award for his songwriting and for his producing, and he has written numerous songs that you have heard on the radio. He wrote, ba 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 be soup <laughs> He did that. And he also wrote uh, several just big, huge hits, one being the last one that he wrote, and uh, we all know this song because it was... Just a great, great song, and it came at a very critical t time in the life of our country, Riding with Private Malone. I want you to make welcome my friend, Wood Newton. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for conceiving of this idea and, and of uh, uh, hooking me into helping you. <laughs> write the thing so I tell you this has been it's been a great experience and I really enjoy it 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 still touches me uh, I also want to name check Rachel Newman she and I wrote that song about uh, one and undivided about Sam Watkins and by the way if you you can I've got the coffee table book uh, that he wrote and I think it was 20 years after the Civil War but he fought in all those battles and it's, it's called it, Company H. Company That's H. That, the way they pronounce A T C H. It. And in order H. to get in order to get in the mood for that, we went to his grave. It's it's down in Murray County at the, at the Mount Zion uh, Church Cemetery. And I'm a muzzleloader, so I took a, a a cap for the cap lock and a 50 caliber uh, round ball, and I put it down there in his grave in case. In case he comes back and there's another uh, conflict, <laughs> you want to be on his side. <laughs> anyway, thanks to Rachel Newman for that. She's wonderful. Yeah. And thank you so much. I'm Daniel Johnson, and we had a really blessed night. Thank you all for coming, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Dan King. Give him a hand. Thank you, Daniel Johnson, Wood Newton, and Cass. That was wonderful. Great job, folks. Thank you for coming. A uh, month from now, we've got Don Henry coming in for Woo! 19 Miles of Music Row. Don's great. As you can hear, Wood is already excited and might just wait here for the whole month till Don comes. Right. I don't know. He looks pretty excited. Anywho, it's going to be another great uh, 19 Miles of Music Row. But we really appreciate you all coming out tonight and g gifting us with this wonderful work. And Michael Ricks, thank you for coming by again, too, pal. Appreciate you. All right, folks. Good night.